So my name is Maggie. I was born and raised in Fillmore, a small town in Fillmore. Um, I'm a substance abuse counselor now, and this is my story. Time we're still making changes. Find the ways to help each other. Many similar faces. There's a way. Meditation and pray. God could pave the way. Many better days in a peaceful place where we lay. A different state of mind in these crazy days. I wait to unwind one day at a time in a sober way. I grew up in a small town. Um, it's called. It was a small town, Fillmore. Um, there's not a lot to do there. It was mainly like drugs and the two gangs that were always rivals. Um, I grew up with seven brothers. Um, I was only I was only sister. How was that? That was rough. That was um, challenging. I grew up in a household where you couldn't show emotions. You couldn't cry. You had to keep your mouth shut. Everything you saw, everything you heard. My mom and my dad separated when I was like ten. So, and my mom was super cool, super chill. So as soon as my dad left, my dad was super strict. He was very physically abusive, verbally abusive. Everything you did wrong was like, oh, you dumb, you stupid. Like, what's wrong with you? Is there something wrong with you? Like, so I, we grew up thinking that we're dumb, you know, but we were real street smart, really, really street smart. So when my dad was out of the picture, Everybody, you know, everyone just ran amok. My brothers were already running amok before that. They were involved in gangs. It was, just, it was just, like I said, it's a small town, so it's pretty much two gangs, and they were they were from the boys. And I grew up, I grew up with my brothers and his friends. My mom would always work. I would stay home. My memories growing up with my brothers, I think the ones that I will never forget was. Every time it was like Thursday, never fell Thursday, Friday, Saturday. My older brother would come home and he would tell me, my mom, you guys got to sleep on the floor tonight. <clears throat> and we already knew what that meant. And sure enough, they would shoot up the house. And it was like a couple of times that happened. I remember one time, I think it was like on the weekend. He told me, go sleep with mom, but you guys got to sleep on the floor. I was like, all right, I already knew. I already got my blanket, my, my pillow. But he's like sleeping in the furthest room, which was like across the house. We slept on the floor and um, sure enough, they came, they shot up the house and the bullets went through my mom's bed. So it was like, oh, whoa, like this is real, you know? I just grew up seeing car loads. I remember coming and it was a lot of my brothers, but it was like more than seven brothers because all his friends were always there. They were always there. Like, they were like my brothers too. Yeah, and I remember them, just a bunch of cars always coming and there was these big old rumbles in front of my house. And I remember being little and I remember, I remember crying and I was like, I couldn't go outside. I just wanted to help them, but I couldn't. I would just be crying in the window and just saying, stop, stop. But it was just, it was just a lot of vivid memories like that. And so I grew up around all that violence, drugs. And I remember my brothers raised me the best they could, I think. Now that I'm older, I realize like, oh, dang. But like, it wasn't your traditional bro brothers. Like, oh, let me show you how to do math or let me show you, um, I don't know. I don't even know because I didn't have that. Like. <laughs> Or get good grades. Or I don't know. Whatever big brothers tell their sisters. But I remember my older brother. He's the one that showed me how to shoot my first Glock. How to how to point. How to shoot. How to count. A lot of money. Um, so I was really good in math growing up. But it's because I learned how to count money. And then um, so yeah, that was that was my upbringing with my brothers. And later on. Um, I ended up getting involved in drugs <clears throat> really early on. I think I was like 15. And I met my daughter's dad and I was with him for about 10 years. And that was very, I went through a lot, you know. He was, on, um, he, he was addicted to drugs. At that time I was already dipping into drugs and 
it was just the drugs, they're just, they transform you, they become, and they're just demons. And I remember um, I got put in the hospital a couple of times. I remember one time he, he hit me so hard that I, he fractured my whole face and I had a purple eye and green eye for like a month and a half, I think. And I remember I didn't want my son to see me, so I sent him with his grandparents and I told him, I remember I made this big lie because I never wanted to tell nobody. And I was always scared to tell my brothers because I already knew what they were going to do. I never told them. I would hide it. I would hide my bruises. I would hide a bunch of stuff. But I remember the day they found out. Yeah, I was scared. I didn't want them to know, but it got to the point where it was just, they just had to know. So I just had a knock on the door and I had his friends there with straps and they're like, well, we're not moving. We're going to stay here. They stayed there for like a week. I was like, can you guys leave now? I remember telling them like, man, can you, you guys leave? And they're like, no. It was just, I have just so many memories like that. And I think my way to cope with all the trauma and abuse and then like the neglect of my dad, I just numbed everything. Like I would just numb it. And I got heavier into drugs and I would drink. I was a multi-addict, I think. Anything that would numb me, like I didn't care. I didn't care if I was gonna die. I didn't care if I was an OD. It didn't matter. Like I was just, I just didn't want to feel anything. And making money was fun. It was, I was reckless. I was, I didn't care. I had no fear in me. Um, I caught two federal cases crossing across the border. The first one didn't even phase me. I didn't even care. I went back and did it again. I was on bail and. And the second one, thankfully, my, one of my close friends did time for it, so, or else I wouldn't even be sitting here. But at that time, I remember I was, like, tired. I was tired of using. I was tired of, like, what am I doing? I'm just, like, I already had my kids. Like, I, and I still didn't care. I was still hurting. I was still broken. I was still, I was just so reckless, like. Now that I think back of it, I'm like, man, I can't believe I would do all those things. Like, I always had like a close friends, you know, close like group of friends that I'm still friends with to this day, but we were all reckless. Like, I remember even being nine months pregnant with my daughter. And it's such a small town that if you don't like, if you don't like a certain, like it's on, like it's on on site. Like there's no even reason to talk. Like, why are we talking? There's no talking. I, I got nothing to say. That's how we were raised. Like, my brothers too. Like, like it was just so crazy. Like, my brothers would be like, I hate girls that talk. Like, why are they talking? There's no reason to talk. You don't like her? Go do what you need to do. Or my brothers would always tell me, they would always get in these arguments with these girls. Watch, I'm going to call my sister. And here I go. I'm like, dang, I don't even want to fight her. She's all big. You better kick her ass. I'm like, dang, all right, well. And then it was Tommy, if she kicks your ass, we're going to kick your ass. So I'm like, dang, I really got to beat her up. But it was the same thing with me. Like, somebody was messing with me, I'll call my brothers. And they were... But I, it was rare when I would get my brothers involved because I loved them so much that I didn't want them to get in trouble, even if it meant to sacrifice me getting hurt. I think that's why I stayed in the abuse for so long without telling them because I love them so much, like, oh, it's okay, like, I got it, like, I'll take it, I'll deal with it later, like, I don't want to get them involved. They're, they were always in and out of prison, and and it was just crazy. Like I said, I think I was talking about my friends, but um, even when I was nine months pregnant with my daughter, um, I remember we were going to go for a walk, me, my son, and my friend, <clears throat> she had her daughter. And we had like beef with these girls and they, they showed up to my mom's house. They knew where I lived. My house was a hot house. Like everyone knew where I lived. And she showed up and I seen her from afar. And she called on my friend. She was two girls and they, they called on my friend and the other one called me out. But of course I was pregnant. I was like, man, there's nothing I can do. But they started fighting and uh, <clears throat> I remember she started stabbing my friend, friend of my son. And I remember telling my son, turn around, turn around. And he was just in shock, you know? He just couldn't move, but she got stabbed like four times. And I don't even know where I got my strength. I don't even know how I did it, but I was pregnant. I remember 
her getting up, <clears throat> she was holding her stomach. They had stabbed her in her lung, her neck, her hand. I remember her, she put her hand around my shoulder and I like carried her in the house. And I don't know how I did it because I was like full blown pregnant. And I remember looking at her and she's like, what's on my neck? And I'm like, oh man, I'm like, nothing, you're good. And I put my hand on her neck because it was squirting out blood. And I carried her in the house and the paramedics came and they thought I was stabbed because my whole belly was full of blood. But I just have a lot of memories like that that created like a lot of anxiety. Like I think the abuse caused me to have a lot of depression. I got diagnosed with PTSD. The drugs didn't help at all. I thought they were helping, but I was just numbing everything. And I remember, like, I remember I started going to church. Someone invited me to church, and I started going. Um, I I would go and I would leave, like, no, I'm good. Like, I'm not ready. Like, I would just wasn't ready. The money was too good. Like, the adrenaline. Like. I just wasn't ready. And I think it was when I caught the second federal case <clears throat> when they were telling us we were both looking at a lot of time. Um, I was like, man, what about my kids? That's when it hit me, like, dang, what about my kids? So I remember I went to church that Sunday. They had like an altar call. And I remember going and I remember an older, like an older, an older lady, she was, she was praying over me and man, I felt so broken. Like I was broken, like, like it hit me. And I was, just, I remember just crying, like, like crying, like a little kid. And, and I thought this breakthrough that day that I can't even explain, like, I can't explain it. There's no words. I would just remember like, just knowing like I'm done, like I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. And I was already, what, 15 years deep into my addiction. And I remember that day I just cried out to God and I was like, man, I'm done. Like, please, like, like take this addiction away from me. Like, I can't do it no more. Like, I'm going to end up dying. Like, I knew I was going to die or I was going to do, or I was going to just be in prison for a really long time. Um... And yeah, um, ever since that day, I don't know what, I can't even explain it, but I know it was a breakthrough for my addiction because I got clean. I started just like, just seeking like, like I knew I was messed up. When I was crying, I remember that day, I didn't use that day too. And I was crying and I was feeling everything, like everything, I'm like, man, I'm a mess. like. I'm broken, like, what am I doing? Like, I need help, like, this is bullshit. Like, what am I doing? I'm just going in circles, like, my son already seen my friend get stabbed. Like, my daughter was little and I remember, um, like, just taking it day by day, like, every day. Like, I remember getting, like, the first week was the worst. I was sick, sick as a dog. I remember throwing up, shaking, I was mad at the world. And the only thing that I would find peace was just when I would go to church. That's the only time. And I remember just like it was a it was it was like for a long time. I remember just being there and just crying, just crying. And I was like, man, why am I crying? I'm such a pussy. Like, what is wrong with me? Like, why am I so broken here? And it was just the presence that I can't explain. Like, and I just started asking God, like, man, show me, show me what to do to like give me peace. Like, I can't do it alone. I can't. I can't. I'm rebellious. Like. I'm out of control, I don't care. Like, what I've learned is that hurt people were, will hurt people. And until I was able to fix myself or start working in myself, that was the only way I was gonna be able to love my kids properly, love my mom properly, my dad. I grew up being real mad at my dad because once he split with my mom, he wasn't in my life for like 15, 10 years. Like my whole time of addiction, and he was hella strict. My dad's really strict. So he like he would shine it off like, ah, like he didn't want no part of that, you know. So um, so yeah, so when I finally got clean, I started um seeing things different. 
I started seeing a therapist. I started being like, man, I got to take care of everything because I didn't realize how much it was affecting me until I finally surrendered it. I was like, oh, man. And then when I got clean, you feel everything. Like, man, I was mad. I, I was crying. I was confused. Like, it was just, everything was such a blur. Like, I just couldn't even think straight. I would wake up in sweats. I would, wake, I would have nightmares. Like, it was like, it's a journey. And it's true what they say. Like, you have to take it one day at a time. Like, if you think too much in advance, it's, it's, it's fear because you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. It's the unknown. But if you take it, just as much as you can, like, manage that's what, I, that's what got me by and, and just praying on it. So now that I'm in this field of addiction, I think it was because I want to I wanna be able to give back what I have now. Like, like it's a trip. Like, now, now I'm working with the county, and, and it's so crazy because when I was younger, I was on probation, and I had this. I had the substance abuse counselor. I had to take these classes to get off probation. I remember I just taking the classes just to get off probation. I didn't even care about the classes. And I had a counselor named Ronnie. He was this big old New York guy. He was super loud. I'll never forget him. He was super cool. Um, and I was at with all the kids that were like at risk kids. And they were like foster kids and all that. And all this time has passed by. And um, now I'm working with that, with that counselor. I seen him. I seen him and I was like, what? He's like, what are you doing here, kid? I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm going to run these groups with you. I'm like, he's like, no way. He's like, that's right. He was so happy. He gave me a hug. And yeah, now I run groups with him with the at-risk kids and foster kids. And I tell these kids my story and they just look at me like, what? Like, like I think they, and then when the beginning they see me, I don't think they think I'm a counselor because I'm all tatted up. You know, I still talk a little ghetto, you know. But they connect with me. I can see, like, they don't even look at him. They just look at me. And I tell them, you know, and they're like, dang. Like, I'm like, there's hope. Don't give up. Like, I was once, like, I was you. I would tell them, like, I was you. And they're like, what? I'm like, man, it's possible. Like, it's never too late to change. It's never too late to recover. Like, there's hope. There's a lot of hope. But you have to want it. How did you start modeling? I started modeling. I think I got started modeling. I think mm, I went to a lowrider shoot, and I think I got for like I got front cover my first shoot, and that one blew up. And then like different artists started wanting to work with me, and then I don't know. Like I'm not even from LA, and it seems like a lot of people from LA know me, and I'm not even I'm like from the 805, so. I just started networking, just, I'm like, I'm like super real, like, I'm super honest, like, I'm super respectful, I don't play that disrespect stuff, so I think they were like, they like me, they, they would mess with me, so that's how I got into that, but when I went back to school, <clears throat> I put a pause on all that, because it was, I had, a, I had to block out the noise, like, I had a like, all that will always be there. In my head, I'm like, man, that's always going to be there. Like, for right now, like, I got to take care of myself because mental health is real. It's so real. Like, especially if you're dealing with depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. Like, if you don't take care of that, that will devour you. It will eat you up alive. And I think until I was like, nah, I just got to focus. So it's been taking all this time. Like, so, yeah, I seek therapy. I meditate. I work out every day. I changed my whole routine um, and and I connect a lot. Now I network with a lot of like, um, with a lot of faith-based um, churches. They do outreaches or like, um, I work with a lot of nonprofits. Um, there's like a nonprofit organization called Twilight Treasures. What do they do? So it's kind of like what, what I do when I go talk to kids. Like, when I talk to these at-risk kids, I'll be like, give me the baddest kid, the one that nobody wants. Give me that one. Or the girl, give me the bad. Oh, man, this is a run. Give it to me. I want the baddest kid because I know I can relate to her. I know, man, like, there's nothing you can tell me that I, I can't speak life into you because I've already done it. Um, so the same thing with the, those, those organizations. They, they target the homeless, the drug addicts, the people that are laying down, like, Spun on, fed on, like we go to the talk to the people that no one wants to talk to, the people that everyone already gave up on. We'll go talk to them, and 
either we'll offer them whatever they need, like food, clothes. We, we, they want to get prayed, they will offer them prayer. If they're ready for recovery, like we'll take them then and there. And there's women's home and men's home that are nonprofit that will take them without insurance, without like no say, like you're ready, let's go. And I, I've talked to girls and I've told them like, if you're ready, I'll take you right now. Like this organization, mm -hmm. are they only based out here or are they they're all over? Yeah, yeah they're all there's there's one in Whittier, there's one in Orange County, there's one in um, San Luis Obispo, there's there's one in Ventura. They're all over, so so I know it's hard because a lot of people are like, Oh, I don't got insurance, oh, I don't got money, rehabs are expensive. There is organizations that will help you. So why don't you name the organization, how they could get a hold of them for anyone that is dealing with something like that, <clears throat> so they can go ahead and reach out to them. Yeah, so the organization, one of them is called Twilight Treasures. There's another one that I work with too with outsiders. They're like international, like they're, there's just a lot of different help out there. I mean, whatever they need, like you guys can always reach out to me. If I can't help you, then for sure I'll guide you the best way I can to an organization that could help you. So the way the, my relationship with my kids are very, very different than the way I was raised. I think I was, once I got clean and I got my shit together, I was like, man, I got to break these, these generational chains. Like I knew like, man, no, like this is not how I want to raise my kids. So my house is ran very differently than, than how I was raised. Like, and I think it's important to, to tell your story because I don't want the day. I mean, it's it's for sure. We're all gonna pass. We're all gonna die. Um, but I don't want somebody else to tell my story how they remembered me. Like I want to be able to tell my story. Like, and this is real. Like, this is how I grew up. This is what happened. But change is possible. There's a lot of hope. Um, any uh, any advice that you might want to give or? Um, I think my advice. Just not give up, have faith, and have hope. Reach out, surround yourself with people that are gonna, that are going to help you grow, and like speak positivity into you, because that will manifest. You're around people that are miserable and that want to see you do bad. You're gonna do bad, but there is a lot of good people still out there. Well, your relationship with your parents now? Oh yeah, yeah. So, um. My relationship is good now with both my parents. I didn't talk to my dad for a long time, but I think because he, he didn't like the way I was living my life, but now we're like super close. He's like super proud of me and he's, he's a really good grandpa to my daughter. And I think that's why I forgave him. Like, okay, he's, I think he's doing everything he couldn't do with me with my daughter and me seeing that. I'm like, all right, it's, it's good, we're good. Do you see that as like, it's helping you heal at the same time because you're seeing how yeah. your dad could have been with you. Yeah, yeah. He does things with my daughter he never did with me, so that's good enough for me. That's my child, so he shows her love, the love I wish I had, that like, that's good enough for me. Yeah, so. So my life now with God is completely different. Um, I think um, surrendering a lot of things that I couldn't control I had no control over. I didn't have control over a lot of things, but this I can control, like my relationships with my family. Um, so yeah. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna listen to anybody, listen to when you pray. Just, just being in that presence, just being silent, even meditating. I know there's a lot of people that don't have faith, but even taking that time just to be with yourself, like block out the noise because the world can is really ugly and it can get super loud but but yeah my walk is very different now <laughs> I think I, I'm like such a geek like I'm just like I can't wait for school I can't wait for church on Sundays like it's super different but this is how I want it to be this is how I want to raise my kids because my my upgrading was super different super crazy so yeah so these interviews are super dope you'll see real people this is just like I'm a living, breathing testimony of it. So I think it's important that people, real people will recognize real. And I think a lot of people need to see that. Yeah, this is my story. Um, super excited what the future has in store for me. Um, and if you want to get a hold of me, my Instagram is mags 
at 497 and this is my story.